faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings at a single bound, this amazing stranger from the planet Krypton, the man of steel, Superman! Possessing remarkable physical strength, Superman fights a never-ending battle for truth and justice, disguised as a mild-mannered newspaper reporter, Clark Kent. I still say Manhattan rightfully belongs to my people. Possibly, but just what do you expect us to do about it? You have a newspaper? Publish the truth. Have the island vacated immediately. It's fantastic. Why, that's ridiculous. Ridiculous? Maybe modern science will make you think differently. <laughs> I've never heard anything so absurd. You know, from the look in his eyes, I'd almost believe he was in earnest. No, he's just a harmless crank. Come ahead, Miss Lane. You wouldn't want to miss this story, I'm sure. Precautionary measure. ready for the greatest story of your career. Come on, Kent. Let's get out of here. This 
looks like a job for Superman. looks just as good as ever. That's right, Clark. Thanks to Superman. Thank you, sir. 
great chap. I wish we had more like him at Annapolis. Yes, sir. Too bad this is his last year. You'll make a grand naval officer. <laughs> Polo Grounds in New York City. Witness this great game between the Army and Navy. Stands are packed, people are standing all over the place, and all eyes are on fresh glory and captain of the Navy. Double wing back. Smith is back. With the ball pass from center, it goes to Smith. It's reversed to Corrigan. Corrigan hits, hits over his own right tackle. He hits the pullback. Knocks him down. He's away. Wait a minute. It's boxed in. Craig and Reynolds are coming in. He hits Craig. Knocks him over. Straight arms runners, and he's across for a touchdown. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Crash Glory, and kept the Navy team playing the finest game of his career. Wait a minute, son. What do you want? I gotta see Lieutenant Corrigan right away. You can't go in there. It's against orders. But I tell you, I gotta see him. It's important. Even if I let you in, you couldn't talk to the lieutenant now. He's busy. All right. <laughs> enough to the source. Oh, there you are, Lieutenant. The signals are coming in much stronger. Oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, this is Miss Compton, staff writer of the time. Oh, everybody knows Crash Corridon. <laughs> that was the signal again. They've been sending it every five minutes. They? Just whom do you mean by they? 
Professor Norton maintains that these signals must be the work of some human agency, apparently coming from the bottom of the ocean. I hope you're not going to spring that fantastic yarn about the lost continent of Atlantis. Exactly. Only now I have some definite evidence. This is pure auricalcum, a metal made by fusing gold and copper. The secret of this process was lost with the Atlanteans. What does that prove? Well, according to every test, the idol couldn't be more than a couple of years old, something made recently. I found it during a recent trip I made in my rocket submarine in, uh, in this general location. And this is where the ancient continent of Atlantis was reported to have sunk thousands of years ago. Contrary to popular belief, Atlantis did not sink overnight, but during a period of years. During this time, the people had ample opportunity to construct a roof of Auricalcum over the city and keep out the ocean waves. Thus, Atlantis, though lost, still lived. <laughs> But your holiness, Unger Khan's men are at the gates. I beg of you to take safety in the citadel. Poseidon, god of Atlantis, has never forsaken his people in time of need. I promise you he will not do so now. There will be no peace in Atlantis until we have broken the power of this evil usurper, Unger Khan. Hopeless, exalted one. Our men are outnumbered. The city is about to fall. Have faith. that Sherrod's army has been driven within the walls of the sacred city. Good. Recall the troops. With those religious fanatics under control, I'll have no more interference with my plans to destroy the upper world. The fool, when you do succeed in sending them to the bottom of the sea, Atlantis will rise once more to its former place in the sun and you will be ruler of all things. Start the disintegrator. Thousands dead, hospitals burning, all communication cut off. Red Cross is appealing for doctors. Special trains are rushing supplies to the stricken area. Governor of the state declared martial law, rushing a militia to the scenes of the disaster. Stand by for further announcements. St. Clair? That's only 300 miles from here. Yes, and according to my calculations, another severe shock will occur any moment. Joe, put that counteracting machine aboard the submarine right away. Do you mean you're going down and try to stop this quake? What a story this will make for my paper. Let me get to a phone. Can I come along, Dad? Some other time, Billy. 
I have something more important for you, Billy. I want you to take a note to the naval base for me. Hurry up, Joe. We've got no time to lose. But, Professor, I, I don't think it's safe to take the submarine down that far. We've got to take that chance. Get those things aboard. Now, quick, give this note to the commanding officer at the naval base. He'll understand. Come on, Joe. I'll give you a hand. This is not an ordinary submarine, Bill. It's propelled by rocket motors, designed by Professor Norton himself. Yes, it's been tested at 2,500 feet, and he's going to try to reach the bottom this time. I'll tell you more about it when I get back. What? Am I going along? You bet I am. Hello. This is Professor Norton's boathouse. Brown and deep. Hello. 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 Will you shut up? Oh, no, no, no. I didn't mean you, Professor Norton. I was talking to Sinbad. Huh? Oh, yeah. R right away. Professor Norton says to get the boat ready for a long trip. shocks originate.
feet. Good. Another 2,000 feet and I can start the counteracting ray. We'll never make it. The submarine will be crushed. You can't hold it yourself, Joe. There's no danger. Why, of course not. Oh, well, you're all mad. If we go any deeper, the submarine will crush like the shell of an egg. Get back there and keep my nose down. We're going through with it. All right. You ask for it. I'll nose her down. I'll send her straight to the bottom. I'll send her to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> Stop him. He'll be all right in a little while. We're down 7,000 feet. And we're still diving. Do you think it's safe to continue? It's the earthquake detector. I'll stop the counteracting ray while you level the ship off. We're down far enough. Interference, Your Majesty. We'll soon find out. So that's what's interfering with my plans. The deep sea craft from the upper world, Your Majesty. Shall I destroy it? Wait. I have a better plan. 
Turn on the magnetic ray and bring them down into Atlantis. Professor Norton. What happened? I don't know. We're on a level keel, but we're being dragged down by some mysterious force. to the inland sea and captured the stranger from the upper world. Captain Hackett? Yes, sir. My horse, quickly. Number one patrol, huh? Number one patrol, prepare to move out. Number two! while we investigate this place. Better hide the control box. Now, there's a good place. Yes, that'll do. Do you think we'd better wait for Briny and Sawley? Oh, it's unnecessary. They'll join us as soon as we catch Sinbad the parrot. My calculations are wrong. We've come across the lost continent of Atlantis. Why, I can hardly believe it. It must be a mirage. Some illusion. Thanks, sir. Why, that's no illusion. Those are hoofbeats. Out of sight. We'll find out if they're friends or enemies. Hey! After
and a hearty Hyo Silver, the Lone Ranger. This is a story of one of the most mysterious characters to appear in the early days of the West. He was a fabulous individual, a man whose presence brought fear to the lawless and hope to those who wanted to make this frontier land their home. He was known as the Lone Ranger. Before his coming, This new land of the West was a wild, unruly territory into which brave American pioneers moved in covered wagons, on horseback, and afoot. Theirs was a rugged existence, for they not only had to settle and build, they had to fight. Here, beyond the reach of law and order, might was right. The best shot was the best man. Born of necessity in this chaotic period of westward expansion, An organization was developed to combat the evil forces of the times. An organization called the Texas Rangers. Ever on the job of maintaining law and order, six Texas Rangers ride alertly across a western landscape. All are courageous, straight-shooting men. At their head is a stranger, a half-breed scout, who one day earlier had appeared at a ranger encampment, suffering from a severe wound. There you are, Collins. Nothing to worry about now. Thanks, Captain. I should worry about a wound. I'm lucky to be alive. You're right. 
Very few people are after those outlaws have struck. So they killed everybody at the trading post. Everyone. Mr. Simpson, his wife, the young Indian helper, even old Pete McHenry. That's too bad. How about the outlaws? Any of them get shot? Four of them were in pretty bad shape. They had to be tied to their horses to ride away. I got two of them myself. Too bad you couldn't hit more of them. Which way'd they go? They rode up north into the Badlands. That's pretty rough country. But with wounded men in tow, they can't travel very fast. We got a chance to catch them. But they have a five-hour start. Even if you overtook them, they outnumber you. Mister, the rangers are used to long odds. How about you? We could use your help in locating their trail if you feel strong enough to ride. I don't need two arms to guide a horse. Besides, I've a score to even up, too. I'll go along. Good man. Boys, pack five days' rations. We've got ten minutes to be in the saddle. Right. Bill, send Captain Reed to me. He's leading your detachment. Yes, sir. So came the half-breed Collins, who rides with a detachment of rangers after the most ruthless outlaw band in the West, the notorious Cavendish Gang. It's their trail, Reed. Yeah. And it indicates they're riding slowly as we figured. Yes, it does. Let's go, boys. Gained on him. These tracks can't be more than three hours old. They're heading off into that canyon. Yeah, it looks that way. Have you been in this vicinity before? A couple of times. I think it might be a good idea for us to check that canyon from the rim first. I'll go ahead and scout the place. One man would be a lot less noticeable than all of us going. All right. We'll wait here and give the horses a rest. Dismount, ma'am. the plan going? All right. The range is the back of the canyon entrance. You think they'll keep on coming? Sure. Why not? They're pretty smart umbers, you know. Yeah. We've tried to get them before. Didn't pan out. I wasn't with you then. Where's Cavendish? He's up there a ways. Leave your horse here. All right. I knew they'd fall for my little trap, Collins. <laughs> that bullet I put in your arm really convinced them. Yeah, Cavendish. It sure did. When I get through around here, it's going to be a long time before any ranger outfit patrols in this section of the country. We're going to make this something they won't forget. Is the ambush all set? Take a gander over there. My men could slaughter a whole army from up here. It looks good to me. Now, we're going to hold our fire until a lawman right in directly below us. Jerry, you tell the boys I'll shoot first. That'll be the signal to open up on the rangers. Right. And Jerry, when a man goes down, I want lead to be kept pouring into him until he looks like a sieve. You got that straight? You back. Come on, Blakey. All right. Collins, you're doing a good job for a new man. Thanks, Chief. 
Now get back there and bring on the Texas Rangers. Yeah, sure. See anything? Yes, but not on the rim. The Cavendish outfit is just leaving the far side of the canyon, about four miles off. Are you sure? I saw their dust. Good. Here we go, men. have taken a wrong turn. Look up there. It's a head wall. No passage through here. Hey, where's Collins? He was right behind us a while ago. I saw him. Look. It's an ambush, men. Spread out and find cover quick. Trader Collins. You got them all. Good. Go on back to your horse. We'll wait for you up here. Well, I thought he was one of us, Chief. He was. Any man who would betray those rangers might be just as quick to turn on us, I figured. And no one does that. It's going to be a nice little reminder for anybody who tries to stop me from now on. Yeah. Now let's get out of here. I've got a lot of work to do in Colby. Yeah. <laughs> Men. 
Many hours after the Cavendish gang has left the ambush scene, a lone figure moves painfully over the rock-strewn ground. A small spring gurgling in a shady cave is his destination. He alone of the six Texas Rangers still lives. His one aim is to reach water and shade. Desperately, he fights off the weakness from loss of blood, which threatens to halt his progress. It is deathly hot. The sun beats down unmercifully. Ahead is that cooling, life-giving water. If his strength can only last. Foot by foot, sheer torture, he pulls himself along. There, out of the hot glare of the sun, only a short distance farther. There's the spring. Now his bandana. There. Cold water never felt better. Never seen sweeter than now. A hundred yards away, Colin stirs, unaware of the existence of the spring and the ranger who lies beside it. He, too, miraculously has escaped a mortal wound from a Cavendish bullet. And he, too, like the ranger knows that death lurks in the hot rays of the sun. He must seek shelter somewhere, quickly, within the confines of the canyon. Weakly, he stumbles off to find shade, to nurse his wounds. Then, as if timed by fate, a third figure, an Indian, enters the hot canyon. Surprised, he sees the results of the Cavendish gang's handiwork. Texas Rangers, sprawled in attitudes of violent death. These were men to whom heroic deeds were a part of each day's work. And now their work was done. Then, by chance, the native spies the figure lying beside the distant pool. He moves forward. I still mean not hurt you. Why, you... You Kimo Sabe. Kimo Sabe? That sounds familiar. That's right, Kimo Sabe. You trusty scout. Trusty scout? Yes, Ranger. Long time back when we both young... Me remember time Indian camp burn. Renegade Indians raid settlement when men of tribe away. Kill my mother, my sisters. They leave me for dead. You found me. Nursed me back to health. Save me from dying. When me well, you give me horse to go find my father. Me take horse only when you accept gift. My ring. It make good luck. Me call you Kimo Sabe. It mean trusty scout. Me never forget you. You remember now? Yes. You... You're Tonto. That's right. Me, Tonto. Now me take care of you. Immediately, the Indian, Tonto, unsaddles his horse and sets up a camp at the entrance of the cave near the pool and the injured man. The ranger's wounds are cleansed and expertly dressed by the Indian, who calls upon all the lore he knows to ease his white friend's suffering. Several days of patient vigil, tender care, and careful feeding bring results. The ranger gradually regains his strength. He is going to live. Tonto, I guess I drifted off again. How long have I been here now? Three days. How you feel? Still a little weak. The other rangers, Tonto, all dead? Hmm. One of them, Captain Reed, was my brother. Too bad. Rangers all fine men. We didn't have a chance, Tonto. It was a perfect ambush and double cross. How did you happen to find me? Me hunt here in Canyon often. Ride in here on scout over yonder. Find rangers and dead horse. 
I see. While you sleep, me bury other rangers over there. Make grave for men. Bring belongings here. That was good of you, Tonto. Them brave men. Yes, they were brave. And they won't be forgotten. I've spent a lot of time thinking. For every one of those men, I'm going to bring a hundred lawbreakers to justice. I'll make that Cavendish gang and every criminal that I can find, for that matter, regret the day those rangers were killed. Tonto, from this moment on, I'm going to devote my life to establishing law and order in this new frontier to make the West a decent place to live. That good. But when Cavendish gang know you escape ambush, you marked man. They hunt you down, many against one. No one is going to know I'm alive. I'm supposed to be dead, and I'm going to stay that way. I'll hide my identity somehow. I'll wear a disguise of some sort. You mean like mask? That's it, Tunnel. From now on, I'll wear a mask. Let's see. There ought to be some material here I can use. Here. This. My brother's vest. Belong to one of the bravest of them all. Me help, Kimosabi. You rest now. All right, Tonto. Thanks. There, face wounds all healed now. Let me have the mask. There. It fits perfectly. Good job, Tonto. Here hat, me washing stream, dry and sun, make whiter. Thanks, Tonto. Here gun to kill bad men. I'm not going to do any killing. You not defend yourself? Oh, I'll shoot if I have to. But I'll shoot to wound, not to kill. A man must die, it's up to the law to decide that. Not the person behind a six-shooter. That's right, Kimosabi. Well, there's just one more thing to be done. What that? Dig another grave. Out there. Who that for? That'll be my grave. There. Just like others. That's good. Only you, Tom, know I'm alive. To the world, I'll be buried here. Beside my brother and my friends. Forever. You all alone now. Last man. You are a lone ranger. Yes, Tonto. I am a lone ranger. Kimosabe, me help you fight outlaw. But, Tonto, don't you have a family? Anyone? No. Me lone like you. Me want law here, too. For all. All right, Tonto. You'll be a lot of help. We'll ride together. Me glad, Kimosabi. Me fight good for you. Take cover, Tonto. That's Collins, a man that led us into ambush. Why him shoot? Undoubtedly, he's after your horse. Collins must have been deserted by the outlaws. He's probably been making his way to that vantage point for some time now. Why him go there, Kimosabi? He knows the only way to get scout is to kill us. He is well protected up there. What we do now? I'm going to keep him back under cover while you make a run for Scout. Take Scout into the cave. Collins won't be able to see you from there. Me do. I'll follow Tonto as soon as you're safe. All right, run! I didn't try. We're going to capture him alive. That hard? Him in a good spot? Yes, but I have an idea how we can do it. You start up the cliff on that side. First tie up Scout. I'll try to draw his fire from the other side of the rocks.
Him dead, Kimo Sabi. But me glad. Him deserve to die. No, Tano. No one should have his life end like this. Better him dead. Like White Parsons say, this act of providence. Now no one know you still live. Yes, that is true. A strange act of providence has protected my secret. Me dig grave for him. All right. I'll get Scout ready for travel. All set, Tano? Me ready. Can we go after rest of Cavendish gang now? As soon as we can. But I've got to get a mount of some sort. We'll head off toward Wild Horse Valley. Here, take Scout. On, boy. For two days, the Lone Ranger and Tato traveled toward the remote valley of Wild Horses where a particularly sturdy breed of horses lives, unknown and unmolested by the hunters of the West. Later, at the entrance to this valley, the Lone Ranger and Tonto hear sounds of a furious battle. Beyond the rocks in a small glen, they catch a glimpse of a huge buffalo about to gore the life out of a fallen horse. Quickly, the Lone Ranger reaches for his gun. You hit him, Kimosabe. I hope it was soon enough, Tano. Buffalo dying. Horse look bad. Me shoot him? No, Tano. I'm going to try to pull him through. Well, old fellow... You're in bad shape. A lot of bumps and bruises. Tato, get some rags from the supplies and bring the canteen. Me do. So in an instant, the Lone Ranger has made a momentous decision. For he has recognized the sterling qualities of the animal he has saved. For some time, the masked man in the Indian camp beside the wounded horse, tending his battle hurts and caring for him as best they know how. Now human hands have done all they can to help nature in healing the animal's wounds. Can the wild stallion rise? Gently the masked man coaxes the horse. Easy. Easy, big fellow. Come on. On your feet. Come on, boy. Come on, boy. Easy, big fellow. Easy. He get bridle and lariat. Him run away. No. Wait, Tonto. I'd like that horse more than anything in the world. But if he wants to go, he should be free. Him a beauty. Like mountain with snow. Silver white. Silver. That would be a name for him. Here, Silver. Come back, big fellow. Run, Silver. Come back, big fellow. Come on, Silver. Me get bridle now. Him come back. No. He wouldn't take a bit. I'll use a hackamore for the time being. Won't be as strange to his head as a bridle. There. There, Silver. You only knew how we need you. Oh. Oh, boy. Oh. Oh. Oh, big fellow. Ready? We're going to do a lot of riding together going to be pals, aren't we, Silver? A few days later, after the horse has recovered his strength, the Lone Ranger tightens the saddle on the back of the white stallion. Quickly, the masked man mounts, and for the first time in his life, Silver bears weight upon his back. Soon, under expert and gentle guidance, 
A horse quiets and responds quickly to the Lone Ranger's lead. Later, the hackamore is exchanged for a bridle and bit. Here is no conflict between animal and master. Here, instead, is a partnership between horse and rider. The Lone Ranger and Silver accept each other as equals. He's a beauty, Tonto. Dream horse if I ever rode one. Him and Scout, good friends. Yes, they'll do a lot of riding side by side. Huh. Me got everything packed. Here's saddlebag. Here, blanket. We ride after Cavendish gang now? Yes, Tonto. They were headed toward Colby. Then, too, there's an old timer there I want to see by the name of Jim Blaine. All right, let's go. Until the caller leaves before we drop in. It's nice seeing you, Judge. Be seeing you next week, Jim. Look, the side of the house. Him, Chief. Good. But he winked me. Is he out? It's cold. He won't be seeing light for hours. Trade guns. Say, you're bleeding bad. Yeah, I must have hit an artery. You get on the road pronto and spread the news to the shoot and then get me a doc. I'll meet you at the Glen. All right. So someone's coming. We got to clear out of here fast. Yonder, Chimusabi. How's Jim? He's had a hard knock. Me thought maybe murders killed Jim, too. They could have, Tonto. For some reason, they wanted Jim to be found here alive. He's coming, too. Help me carry him to the porch. So that's why I'm after Cavendish, Jim. The reason for the mask. My real identity is to be kept a secret. Known only to the three of us. Well, I'll be hanged. You sure got a job cut out for yourself, Reed. I mean, Lone Ranger. I'll help him any way I can. I was hoping you'd join us, Jim. And live up at our old silver mine. Oh, you're mighty kind to an old ex-ranger who used to nurse me, you boy. Sure would like to. Never did like living here trying to farm, only... Only what? Well, I can't run out now with the owner of the bank. Poor old Judge Knox lying dead back there. Folks might think that I did it. Why, they might start blaming me for all the rest of the killings that's going on in town. More murders, Jim? Yes, lots of them. First, it was Lem Peters. He owns a newspaper. Then Biff Anderson, postmaster and telegraph man combined. Then Max Strauss, the hotel man. And a couple others, too. Why, it seems everybody important in Colby is getting shot. The sheriff's plumb going crazy. Did you recognize the man who killed the judge? Couldn't mistake him. It was Butch Cavendish. The owl hoot you said you're after. Cavendish. He must be doing these killings in Colby for a very special reason. Yeah, but why? Most likely he wanted the murders to look like a local affair. I'm certain Jim will upset his plans if you're not around to accept the blame for the judge's death. That old silver mine of ours will be a perfect hideout for you. Yes, it would. 
By cranky, I guess you're right. It would be best if I became scarce around here for a bit. I'll go along with you. That's fine. How's his knee, Tonto? Leg better now. Good. Help me put Jim on Silver's back. A few hours later, after a tedious ride over winding trails and unknown paths, the Lone Ranger, Jim, and Tonto approached the site of the secret silver mine. This is it, Tonto. Where mine? Don't see it, do you, Engine? <laughs> Fooled you just like everybody else. Come on, I'll show you. What's the matter with lead bullets? They'll kill just as well as... You forget, I told you I vowed never to shoot to kill. Silver bullets will serve as sort of a symbol. Tano suggested the idea. Symbol? Of what? A symbol which means justice by law. I want it to become known to all who see the silver bullets. But I live and fight only to see the eventual defeat and the proper punishment by law of every criminal in the West. By criminy, I think you've got something there. And I'll mold you all the silver bullets you want, Ranger. But from what I know about this here country, there'll be an awful lot of silver shot up before you're through. I hope not, Jim. We have a lot of metal here for that purpose. If we need it. Yeah, those dirty killers. I wish I knew where to look for them first. Now, Pete, you look up in that old creek section for Jim. Lem, go get Creel and fetch the doc's body and bring it back into town. This is a fine time for Doc Drummond to be missing. Jim Blaine disappearing. I never suspected he'd ever have anything to do with these killings. Sure. Well, go away, Angie. Can't see I'm busy? Now, Bill Keith says that Jim's horse is still at his farm. Oh, he must have gone off on foot. Now, he can't be very sure. tight. Me know where Jim Blaine is. Look, Indian, will you go away, please? Can't you see I'm busy with these men? What'd you say? Me know where Jim Blaine is. Him want to see you. Well, you know where he is. Why didn't you say so? Where is he? Me not tell. What do you mean by that? You just said you knew. You come. Me take you to Jim. Now, wait a minute. How do I know that you know where Jim is? You don't know, but you follow me. Jim wants to talk to you about Judge Knox killing. <laughs> Bet he does, all right. Yeah, and I want to talk to him, too. Hank, you and I are saddle up. We're going to follow this engine. No one come. Only you. Now, look. You don't think I'd be silly enough to go with you alone, do you? Me think so. You brave lawman want to solve mystery. Maybe you're right. Well, maybe he's right, huh? Uh, how long a ride is it? Not far for tough sheriff. 
Maybe two hours away. All right, engine. You lead the way. But don't forget, any funny business? Hank, keep an eye on things when I come back. All right, two done. Just a minute, stranger. Down the gun, Sheriff. I can explain. Howdy, two guns! Jim, what the Sam Hill's going on here? Who are these people? Who's this masked man? What about Judge Knox shooting? Somebody's got a heap of explaining to do. And after the killers knocked me out and changed guns with me, my friend and his engine pal brought me here. It's a very interesting story, Jim. What's more interesting, maybe, is that you've convinced me the masked man here is fighting on the right side of the law. I'm glad you're convinced, Sheriff. So Butch Cavendish is the judge's murderer, huh? Yep. And right now he's somewhere in this here vicinity, wounded, with my bullet in him. Wounded, huh? Say, maybe that explains something. Old Doc Drummond's the only doc in these parts, and he's missing. Ten to one he's been fetched to fix up Cavendish. Yeah, the problem now is, where's Cavendish hiding out? He left a trail leading away from Jim's farm. I think I might be able to follow it, Sheriff. Good, I'll get some men from town. That'll take too much time. It would be quicker for you to come with me now. Tano can ride to town. Me do, then follow your trail. All right, engine. See my man Creel at the office. Mm -hmm. He'll get some men. Watch it late, Jim. Look here. Wagon tracks. Cavendish was followed by someone in the wagon, a horseman riding alongside of it. Those tracks were made by Doc Drummond's rig. He's got the only narrow rims around here. So far, so good. Let's go. Take it easy. Well, I'm doing the best I can. There it is. All right, get on with the bandage, and I'm in a hurry. What's the matter? Are you uh, scared of something? Like uh, maybe the uh, sheriff will find us? Why should I be? I'm getting rid of him just like I did everybody else of importance in Colby. You mean to say that you're responsible for all those murders that have happened in the last week? Sure. Might as well let you know. You see, Doc, all the men that have stepped into the uh, vacated positions belong to my organization. It's taken a lot of planning, but we're just about set. I'm taking over Colby. Well, why are you telling me this? I'm going to be needing the sawbones in my organization, and I've just decided you're going to be him. Like blazes I am. I'd die before I'd help a pack of coyotes like... What was that? Don't gun, Nag. I think they heard us. Somebody over there. Give me that gun. I'll cover the dock. You boys get over there and find out. Here they come. Take cover. There, my man will take care of it. Watch these men, Sheriff. I'll go help the doc. Jerry! Pike! What's going on? Answer! You go take a look. I want to find out what's happening. But don't run. I've got this on your back.
Cavendish, drop that gun. All right, Sheriff. Bring in the others. You all right, Doc? Yeah, I'm all right. Who's the masked man? He's on the side of the law. Well, this crook was going to take over Colby. He admitted all those murders. We know, Doc. We overheard him. Sheriff, you can take Cavendish to town in Doc's buggy. These other three will tie up and put on their horses. Doc, do you know where their mounts are? Yes, behind the rocks over yonder. Thanks. Here you are, Doc. Watch these owl hoots close while I tie them up. Yeah. I hope they do make a move, especially this one. Remember this, boys. I'm not in jail yet. Shut up. Working your mouth is making a move. Come on, Silver. Silver. What's wrong, Silver? Those are my men. I knew they were due here about this time. So you thought you had me, sir. Well, you have. <laughs> you, the sawbones, and that masked man over there behind those rocks can start counting the minutes you got to live. Beginning right now. Silver. Boys, I got him. Get him high, Sheriff. Come on in, men. It's me, Cavendish. The shooting's over. Looks like we got here just in time, boss. You did. Tie these men up. What goes on? I got winged after I shot Judge Knox. The sawbones there was treating me when the sheriff and the masked man took things over. Is that the hombre we seen ride off on the white horse? Yeah, which way did he go? Up the draw. It's all tied up, boss. Good. I'll watch him. You men get after that masked man before he gets to Colby and spoils our plans. And bring him back dead or alive. You heard it, boys. Let's travel. Meanwhile, unaware of what has happened to the Lone Ranger since last he saw him, Tonto has arrived in the town of Colby. He's on his way to the sheriff's office to ask the sheriff's assistant, Alex Creel, for more men to aid the Lone Ranger in tracking down Butch Cavendish. The way you keep on cleaning that gun, Corey, you must be figuring on using it soon. Nothing like being prepared. Might a lot's been going on around Colby lately, and the shooting's only just begun. Creel says there's going to be more of it tonight. Which one of you is sheriff's assistant? It isn't often a redskin comes looking for the sheriff. It's usually the other way around. What do you want, Indian? Me want to see Creel. At present, he's busy. I'm handling his business. What's on your mind? Sheriff Taylor sent me. Him on trail of Butch Cavendish. Asked for Creel to come with posse. Oh, he did, huh? You're lying, Indian. Everybody around here knows that Cavendish gang is nowhere around here. That's not so. I see Cavendish myself. You come. I show you trail. Will you listen to the redskin ordering us around? I don't know what your game is, Indian. But if Sheriff Taylor really sent you, you'd have some kind of proof. You follow Tonto. You have plenty proof. Seems to me this Redskin's getting a little ornery, Corey. Shall I throw him in jail? No, there you go. Don't come nosing around here again, or you won't get off so easy. Creel left orders not to lead a posse anywhere. Say, Corey, do you think he was on the level about the sheriff being on Cavendish's trail? Of course he was on the level. Why do you think I was trying to protect Cavendish? With all of our plans set for tonight, we can't let the sheriff mess things up. But if that engine gets back to the sheriff and tells him the Creel... Yeah, we're not going to get back to the sheriff, because you're going to see that he doesn't. Savvy? Oh, uh, I savvy. you got nothing to worry about.
Keep making sure, engine. Follow trail, Kimosabe. Take long time. Where's the posse? No posse. Sheriff's men and Colby wouldn't send men with me. It must be one of Cavendish's men. That's right. Him send men to ambush me. But me take care of him. You find Cavendish? Yes. But his men rode down from the hills and surrounded the sheriff and Doc Drummond. We go back and round them up? No, there are too many of them. We need a whole troop of cavalry to capture them all. But I've got a plan, Tonto. Now, here's the idea. We'll circle back. That's Cavendish's horse. He must still be here. The rest of his men are out looking for me. Where, Doc and Sheriff? Over in the glen behind the brush. Come on, Tonto. be here with the doc. I imagine that Cavendish is watching our friends until his men return. We'll sneak up to the glen. If Cavendish is there, I'll want to surprise him. Then you know what to do. The hoot owl. Me understand. We'll leave our horses here. be strong enough to travel, but I got strength enough to pull a trigger. You won't get away with this. How long do you think honest people are going to condone activities like yours, Cavendish? You know I've got men in my office who've sworn never to rest until you're captured. Uh, myself included, of course. And that masked man, he's one of my special secret deputies. Your men will never catch him. You know, Cavendish, the doc here and I and uh, and the mask man, we know a lot more about you than you think we do. Why, there's handbills on you all over this territory, pasted on every rock and every tree. You'll never get out of here. And another thing. Woohoo! Yeah, that boy, stranger, you're a sight for sore eyes. Yeah, I thought we were goners. Who's the Indian? He's my friend. Are you both all right? Yeah, we're all right. Yeah. Cavendish is out cold. Where you been, stranger? I was getting worried. I rode off on Silver. Met Tano coming from Colby. We sneaked in here the back way. Sheriff, your man Creel in town wouldn't send the posse. Him no believe, Tonto. Well, then that proves he's part of this murder and fiend's band. And I can name more in town that are working with him. Well, 
Anyway, we got Cavendish. We can load him in Doc's rig and take him on into town. Wait a minute, Sheriff. I want to capture more of the gang than just Cavendish. He's the leader. With help, we can capture him and his entire band when they return. Take too long to get help from Colby. They'll all get away. There's help much closer than town, Sheriff. Tonto said he saw a cavalry detachment passing a short distance off. We'll get their help. I'll leave Cavendish here. He's out and too weak to travel anyway. Well, whatever you say. All right, let's go. Come on, Doc. Don't worry, you're not going to lose me. Which way to the cavalry, mister? Take the right fork and circle back to Colby. To Colby? What about the cavalry? There are no cavalry. Thought you said they're passing through hereabouts. What I said was for Cavendish to hear. But he couldn't hear anything. He was unconscious. You should have examined him when I did, Doc. He was faking. Well, if there's no cavalry, just what in tarnation are you aiming to do? I'm trying to delay Cavendish's plan, Sheriff, to gain time. We have a lot to do tonight in Colby. All right, Doc. Let's get on with it. All right. Some of these men spotted the masked man, Chief, at the scent she didn't head for Colby. I know he didn't. Say, what happened to the prisoners? The masked man must have hidden the brush nearby. While you were out straight in the eyes for him, he come back here with an engine friend. Turned the prisoners loose, huh? Yeah. They all lit out fast, but not for Colby. They went the opposite direction. Where did they go? I overheard the masked man tell the sheriff there's a group of cavalry passing nearby. Now, they've gone up to get them to round us all up. So we got to work fast. Green, you, Sellers, and Shep stick here with me. We'll go back to the hideout. The rest of you try to head off the prisoners. See if you can spot that cavalry, too. This is going to delay my plans concerning Colby a bit. I can't take any chances. Now get stirring. I sure hope Cleo didn't see us come in here. The sheriff's office is practically next door to mine, and I noticed the lights were still on. That's all for the good, Doc. It will give Tonto a chance to sneak over there and see if anyone else is in the office with Creel. While he's gone, we can make up that list of the names of the people we want to surprise. Me go now, Kimutabi. Be careful, Tonto. Remember, Creel is one of Cavendish's men. You know what happened the last time you tried to see him. Me be plenty careful. You make list ready. Tonto will be back fast. Are we sure that we hid your horses and my wagon far enough out of town? If anybody gets wind we're here, there'll be trouble. If we act fast enough, nobody will have time to stop us. All right, Sheriff, write down the names of the new men in town. The ones who've been taking over all the top jobs. Well, first of all, there's Creel, of course. Put his name at the head of the list. If we take the jail first, we'll have a place to lock up all the others. And then there's Keeler. He took over the bank as soon as the judge was murdered. Keeler... Yes, old Jim told me about him. Yeah, and what about Ant? He was put in charge of the telegraph all this mighty sudden. Ant, I've heard of him, too. Then there's uh, Jessup. He's that new gunsmith. And Peters, Dude, and Corey. Well, Tonto, what did you find out? Me take Pete to window of Sheriff's office. See Creel in there with one man. Just two of them, eh? All right, Sheriff. Doc, we'll start with Creel and his friend. And if everything goes well, we'll end up with the whole Cavendish gang. All right, come on, boys. I wonder what's keeping Cavendish. Sure getting to be late enough. Oh, I don't know, Creel. Maybe him and the boys were held up. Probably just sent us a message or something. Who is it? It's me, Doc Drummond. An emergency. Doc, I thought you was on a town trip. Quiet, you two. Keep your hands high. Say, what's going on here? Plenty, Creel. Tonto, get Red's gun. We have reasons to believe you two are working for Butch Cavendish. 
And I've got an idea. Those credentials you showed me to get your job were forged. Now, wait a minute. You can't prove Shut that. up. Get in that cell. You too, Red. Two gun, give me that list you made of Creel's pals, Fetcher. All right. All right, Doc. We've got to hurry. It's getting light outside. Come on, Tonto. Are you running the bank now in place of Judge Knox? Yeah, but what's that got to do with it? Well, take a gander. The place is on fire. Fire? All right, Keeler. March. Huh? Keeler, check. One down and seven to go. Are you the gent that took over the telegraph office when Biff Anderson got his? What about it, Doc? Well, come on quick. Your place is on fire. What? Put your hands up, Rivers. Fire? On your way, Jessup. No trace of the masked man and his friends, sir. No, we spent the whole night looking. What about the cavalry? Must have gone through here awful fast, Chief. Nary a sign of them now. Good. Then there's nothing to stop us from moving into Colby right now. Right. Let's go. All right, men. You heard the math, man. Everything goes as we figured. We'll have the Cavendish gang locked up by sundown. Hello, are your men all set? Yes, Kimosabi. Here they come. All right, boys. Let's go get them. What, Silver? We can take them. We outnumber them. Let them have it, men.
me, stranger. Drop your gun, Cavendish. It's been a long chase. Now you're through for good. I guess you're right. All right? Let's go. Where to? Back to the fight. Where'd you say? I said... Now get going. Name. Name. Put him in one. I sure am glad to see them. Name. Shorty Bush. Finally got you, huh? Put him in two. Let's go. I'm going. Name. Six Lambert. One. Okay. And I want to tell you that the whole town of Colby is proud of you, two guns. Well, I appreciate that a lot, Jim, but we had very little. Jim, come now, Sheriff. Here he is, Sheriff. Hello, Cavendish. Didn't think you'd catch him, partner. Now we got the whole dang bunch. You and your men are to be congratulated, Sheriff. Thanks. But if it hadn't been for you, we'd have gotten nowhere. I'll be with you in just a minute. I'll take care of this one personally. Come on. Hey, there, Silver. No, Cavendish can't catch it, Kimotabi. You take off, Matt. I'm going to continue to wear the mask and keep my identity a secret. For how long? Our job has just begun. We have a lot of trails to follow. That good. Sheriff, before the lockup, do you mind telling me who the masked man is? Wouldn't mind at all, except that... Hey, where'd the masked man go? He and his Indian pal are going out to get the horses, Sheriff. Well... Guess he isn't one to stick around for a party. Well, who is he? I don't rightly know his real name, but I've heard him called the Lone Ranger. show starts, let's enjoy an intermission. You'll find our snack bar chock full of good things to eat and drink. Fresh, crunchy popcorn. Intermission time. Time that stretch you've been wanting. And best of all... Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. You get more out of life when you go out to a movie. Show starts in four minutes. Refresh yourself. It's intermission time. The concession stand is open and ready to serve you. Yum, yum. It's time for a tasty and refreshing snack.
For your convenience, we shall keep you informed of the remaining intermission time, three minutes before the next show starts. with us this evening and want you to enjoy every minute of your stay here. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby. What's to eat? What's to drink? Good food galore. Quick as a wink. Start in one minute. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby. Intermission time. Time that stretch you've been wanting. And best of all... Injunction, thou shalt not kill, is one that requires qualification in view of our broader knowledge of impulses behind homicide. The uh, various legal categories, such as first and second degree murder, various degrees of homicide, manslaughter, are civilized recognitions of impulses of various degrees of culpability. The man who kills in self-defense, for instance, must not be judged by the same standards applied to the man who kills for gain. <laughs> what 
What are you doing tonight? Well, I'm having dinner with Layla and Boxton at the club. Well, I just don't want you to stay cooped up every night working all the time. Well, I won't. I promise you I'll get out. All right, dear. I should think you would after classes all day. But once you get your nose into a book... Mama, then... they're going. Yes, dear. Goodbye, darling. I'm so sorry you're not going with us. So am I, but you have a good time. Don't you worry about it. Will you miss me? Every minute of the day, every second of the night. Mama! Bye, sweetie. Kiss Daddy goodbye. Goodbye, you little brat. <laughs> so long, Pop. So long. And mind Mother, both of you. Yes, sir. Watch the... Yes, I will, dear. With our sweetheart. Hello, Michael. How are you, Frank? Fancy, Richard. Who is she? Haven't the faintest idea, but we've decided she's our dream girl, just from that picture. That's right. We saw her first. Well, it's an extraordinary portrait. Extraordinary woman, too, I bet. <laughs> well, what's the program now, huh? Stork Club, Billy Roses. <laughs> Well, I uh, hate to disappoint you, gentlemen, but the program, as far as I'm concerned, is one cigar, another drink, barely to bed. <laughs> I have a lecture at nine tomorrow morning, and I expect to deliver it without support. Do you mean to sit there and tell us that on the first night of your summer bachelorhood, Can't you're not check. even going to a burlesque show? No, but if one of the young ladies wishes to come over here and perform about uh, there, I'll only be too happy to watch. Incredible. <laughs> Absolutely shameful. <laughs> it's outraging tradition. Well, look, I'm a middle-aged man. We all are. We're three old crocs, and that sort of shenanigan is out for us. Just a minute. I don't know that I like being described as an old croc. No, Michael, he's right, I'm afraid. And it's a darn good thing, too. Men our age... I didn't say that. I didn't say it was a good thing. Because I don't know that it is. All I know is that I hate it. I hate this solidity, the stodginess I'm beginning to feel. To me, it's the end of the brightness of life, the end of spirit and adventure. Don't talk like that. Men of our years have no business playing around with any adventure that they can avoid. Hmm? We're like athletes who are out of condition. <laughs> we can't handle that sort of thing anymore. Life ends at 40. Hmm? In the district attorney's office, we see what happens to middle-aged men who try to act like coats. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not joking when I tell you that I've seen genuine, actual tragedy issuing directly out of pure carelessness, out of the merest trifles. Casual impulse, an idle flirtation, one drink too many. Oh, ho. how many is that? Third, isn't it? <laughs> Great Scott, he's lost count already. <laughs> he's a strictly two-drink man, always has been for years. I'm sorry if I sound stuffy. But trouble starts, too, from little things, often from some forgotten natural tendency. <laughs> yes, well, I have a date for an idle flirtation with Donna Turner, <laughs> but we won't dance. <laughs> Tomorrow night? Hey, good. Why don't we make it every night? The three of us, unless we've got something better to do. Well, fine, that's a good idea. I think I'll run along with you. Splendid. Maybe Donna can dig up for Rita Hayworth for you. Well, what about me? Do you think it's quite safe to leave me alone in this somewhat rebellious state of mind? No, you'll be all right, I'm sure. Just you run along to bed like a good fellow and forget the whole matter. He's much too old for the sort of thing we have in mind, isn't he, huh? <laughs> That'd be good. <laughs> Dick, I really would like oh, to... Oh, stop worrying. You know, I don't agree with the words you've said, but the disagreement is purely academic. You know, that's exactly my complaint. The flesh is still strong, but the spirit grows weaker by the hour. <laughs> good. You know, even if the spirit of adventure should rise up before me and beckon, even in the form of that uh, alluring young woman in the window next door, <laughs> I'm afraid that all I do is clutch my coat a little tighter, mutter something idiotic and run like the devil. Not before you got our number, I hope. 
Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. <laughs> You're safe, I guess. Good night, Dick. <laughs> Would you be uh, good enough to remind me when it's 10.30? Yes, sir. Sometimes I'm inclined to lose track of time. Well, I'll remind you, sir. Thank you, sir. It's 10.30, Professor Wandy. Hmm? It's 10.30, sir. Do you mind putting it back in the library? Yes, sir. Thank you. My hat, please. general reactions. One is a kind of solemn stare for the painting. Mm -hmm. and, and the other? The other is a long, low whistle. What was mine? I'm not sure, but I suspect that in another moment or two, you might have given a long, low, solemn whistle. Well, that uh, rather embarrasses me. Well, it shouldn't. I regard it as an unusually sincere compliment, because you don't look to me like a man much given to whistling. Oh, no, no, it's not that exactly, but uh, if my admiration was that obvious, I'm afraid you might misunderstand. Uh... May I help you? Could you? I'm not married. I have no designs on you. And one drink is all I'd care for. Is that right? That's right. Thank you very much. Ha, 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 ha. 
<laughs> What's so funny? Well, I, I had dinner with a couple of friends tonight, and uh, we discussed your portrait. With great admiration, I might say. I'm thinking of their faces tomorrow night when I tell them about this. Sitting and chatting over a drink with the charming young lady herself. Would you like to see some more of his work? I would indeed. I like it very much. Then when you finish your drink, you can take me home and I'll show them to you. They're just sketches, but quite good, I think. They're of me, of course. A little late, isn't it? Is that late? Eleven? I don't think I should. Don't think you should? What do you mean? I was warned. You mean you're afraid of me? Oh, no, 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 it's not that, but... Uh... I was warned against the siren call of adventure. At my age, I should never have stopped to talk with you. I should never, never have come here to drink with you. Never? Clemens, who did the one in the window, did these. Just sketches, but nice, I think. Beautiful. Let's have another. I should say no, I know. But I haven't the slightest intention of saying it. I should say not. <laughs> this is much too pleasant to break up. <laughs> Cut yourself? No, but the wire broke. Have you something to cut it with? Scissors all right? Yes, I think that'll do. Who are you? My name is... Uh... Frank! Frank, don't listen to me! I told you if you ever... Stop that, you fool! Fool, eh?
don't know. Call the police, I suppose. What was his name? Howard. Frank Howard. That's what he told me. Don't you think it was? I don't know. I don't think so, but I don't know. He never told me anything else. Where he lived, what he did, anything. I saw him two or three times a week, perhaps. He never took me out to dinner or a show or anything. What? What are you? Where's the telephone? In the bedroom. seen you with him? We've never been out together. When you met him? That was on a train. Why? Who knows at all about you and him? Unless he told someone. Which I doubt. Nobody. You've never mentioned him to anybody? Not his name. Not even the name he gave me. Do you think there's something we can do? I was just wondering. I was wondering if anybody could have seen him coming in here tonight. I'm sure not. He wouldn't even get out of the cab if there was anyone around. Do you think there's something we can do? Do you? I don't want to go to jail. Try to keep calm, please. Let's think about it a minute. Let's see if there is anything. They'll never believe us, you know. No, I'm afraid they won't, but... Even if they did, we wouldn't be much better off. So say we could make up any kind of story we wanted to. Who else saw it? They'll make it some kind of murder. I know they will. Uh, please. I have no feeling about him. He was trying to kill me. There's no question about that. If I hadn't killed him, he'd have killed me. If you hadn't given me the scissors, I'd be dead. But whatever they believe, I'm ruined my whole life. You were thinking of something. What was it? Well, I was wondering if we had the nerve for something. Something pretty dangerous. It would shut the door on us completely if we were caught. Anything you say. I don't want to go to jail. I don't. Well, it's this. If nobody knows about you, if nobody saw him coming in here tonight, how could either of us be connected with it if his body were found miles and miles away from here? But how? I'll have to go and get my car. I'll park it directly in front of the door. And then we'll pick our moment. You'll watch while I carry it out and put it in the bag. And then I'll dump it somewhere in the country. It'll be found, of course, sooner or later, but maybe not for a week. You mean you'll go for your car? While I wait here? Would you be afraid? Not of that. But if you got out of here, why should you ever come back? I like you. I think you're all right, but 
I don't even know your name. And I don't think there's a man in the world that wouldn't get out of a mess like this if he could. Oh, we mustn't quarrel. If we do that, we're lost, both of us. Why can't I go with you? Well, I'm hoping we can get ourselves out of this completely. But there's one condition. I won't tell you my name, what I do, or take you to get the car, because then you'd know where I live. But if we're successful tonight, it'll be of no importance to you. i tell you what I'll do. You leave something here. Leave your vest with me. That would be a clue if you didn't come back. Well, that's fair enough. There's almost no blood outside, fortunately. Have you a dark blanket we can wrap them in? I have one. Is a, I have no idea what the police can do with clues. But a great deal, I'm sure. I've read of things a little short of miraculous by the city police as well as the FBI. From a piece of cloth or even a button. It's now 1.15. I'll have to take the subway, so I probably won't be able to make it much under three quarters of an hour. Maybe an hour. But even if I'm longer than that, don't worry. Don't get panicky and call the police, because I promise you I'll be back. I won't fail you. 2.15. Now look outside, will you? Yes. I'd like my car, please. Yes, sir. Hey, Charlie. Yeah? Professor Wanley's car. Right away. Kind of late for you, isn't it? Yes, later than I expected. Hey, you know Mr. Ward in your building? Yes. Four o'clock Sunday morning, he got in. Better get them brakes adjusted. First chance you get. They're pretty loose. I will. Don't you ever turn your lights on at night? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought the garage man turned them on. Let's see your driver's license.
Warnley, huh? What's that, Polish? No, it's American. Do you have any other identification? I have a letter here from the Board of Education. Professor, huh? Assistant. Okay. Watch those lights from now on. Just as you left us. The name on the mailbox is Reed, Alice Reed, in case you have to come again. Well, if we're lucky, I don't think there'd be any occasion for that. Is that the blanket? Yes. First, I imagine we ought to get rid of the more obvious means of identification. I've already done that. You searched him? It had to be done, didn't it? With the name on it? No, but... C.M. Tell me, Frank Howard, that's all I know. All right. Tie it all up and tomorrow get on one of the ferries. Not during a rush hour and drop it overboard. And be very careful that you aren't seen. The money, too? Well, you might as well keep it. I don't see how that could be traced. And what about the watch? I'll do exactly as I tell you, please. Right. Otherwise, we might as well give ourselves up now. can't afford to overlook one detail. We've got to think of everything in advance. Remember that. I wouldn't. How about this rug? There's only a little spot. I can get that out myself. Well, do it very thoroughly, will you? I've read of laboratory tests that make the fine signs of blood that the naked eye could never see. I can clean it. And the scissors. You better boil them. Something might be left in the mechanism. All right. Anything else, Miss Ruff? This hat. Something for the table. Now, when I leave here, I want you to go over the whole place thoroughly. Wash these glasses and put them back on the shelf. Uh, get rid of these bottles. Clean everything thoroughly. There mustn't be one sign left that you've had any visitor tonight. Him, me, or anybody else. Uh, give me that paper. I'll give you the blanket back as soon as I've got him in the car. Better examine it very carefully, too. I'll clean everything. I won't go to bed until I've cleaned everything in the place. Now put out the lights. Go out and see.
I won't see you again, I suppose. For both our sakes, I hope this ends the whole thing completely and forever. All right, then. Goodbye. Goodbye. Never mind, here's another. Well, it couldn't have gone far. That's all right. If you find it later, you can have it. Thanks. Hey, this is a penny. That's okay. Well, well thanks for the dime. If I find it.
Hoffman Port, Dad. Yes. William. Check, please. Yes, sir. This is mine tonight. Oh, thank you. Did uh, Frank say what kept him? Something important, I imagine. He sounded excited. Well, I can't quite picture Frank excited. <laughs> Sir. Must have left mine. Thank you, sir. Coffee in the lounge. Very well, sir. He was talking from the police commissioner's office. Ah, there he is. Well, shall we go back? No. I'm not going to eat now. I'm going to have a drink. How are you, Richard? Fine, thank you. Account for yourself. Come inside. You'll be interested in this. Oh, Collins, get me an old-fashioned one. Yes, sir. Let's go over here. Hot news? Very. But confidential for the moment. Claude Mazard has disappeared. Claude Mazard? Yes. But, um, how do you mean, disappeared? Exactly what the word means. He left Washington yesterday afternoon. He arrived at Penn Station last night. And from there, he's literally disappeared. Is that, uh... The promoter? Oh, my dear Richard, don't be vulgar. <laughs> when a promoter has promoted a colossus like World Enterprises Incorporated, he's no longer a promoter, he's a financier. Oh, yes, yes, of course, I remember now. We're going to wait until... <clears throat> no, not for me, I've got no fashion card. We're going to wait until midnight, on the off chance he shows up. But if he hasn't checked in by then, we'll give it to the papers and then watch the fireworks. Uh, the market? And how. What did he look like? Or rather, I mean, uh, uh, what sort of fellow was he? A too perfect nuisance. He was a patient of mine for a while. For what? <coughs> Nerves, uh, blood pressure. <laughs> he had the most ungovernable temper I've ever known. He'd no idea how pleased I was when he called me a quack and stumped out. Well, uh, just because man doesn't show up for a day, I see no reason to assume that he's been murdered. I didn't say he was murdered. <laughs> Mr. Laylock! Oh, Mr. Laylock! Yeah? Uh, telephone, Mr. Laylock. Thank you. Excuse me. <laughs> I, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> I suppose because his whole manner, the way he talked, seemed to indicate murder. Violence of some kind. It did. That's what he's suspicious of, too. He's an uncanny instinct for things like that. The old head goes up like a bird does. Yes, I can imagine he'd be pretty terrifying once he got the scent. <laughs> you bet. o'clock in the midnight news from station WPQ to the courtesy of Castolo Rex, that tangy, bracing acid remedy for that tired feeling. But first a word about Castolo Rex. Wise Mother Nature has balanced the chemical contents of the gastric juices so carefully that heartburn, acid stomach, or an upset digestive system resulting from overindulgence in food and drink can bright a person's whole outlook on life. But why suffer when Castolo Rex, Mother Nature's own helping hand, is available at your nearest drugstore? Try it today and every day. Now for the news. The police have just announced the mysterious disappearance of Claude Mazard, founder of the fabulous public utilities empire of World Enterprises Incorporated, under circumstances indicating foul play. At the same time, World Enterprises Incorporated have offered a reward of $10,000 for any information as to his whereabouts, dead or alive. 
After checking a briefcase at Pennsylvania Station about 10.30 o'clock last night... extension when I found Mr. Mr. Mather's remains. No, I was not scared. A Boy Scout is never scared. If I get the reward, I will send my younger brother to some good college and I will go to Harvard. I think we can be pretty confident about this one. Looks easy to you? Well, not exactly easy, but not too tough. Plenty of clues, eh? Some. And the circumstances add up so far. For instance, he wasn't killed in the woods, of course. He was killed somewhere else, and the body taken to the spot where he was found. How do you know that? We got the tire marks of a parked car. That's as good as a fingerprint, so far as the car's concerned. But how do you know it was the murderer's car? Footprints in the same soft ground leading from the car and back to it. Deep prints when he was going into the wood, carrying something heavy. Lighter coming back without his burden. Not much question as to that, is it? No, I suppose not. We've got photographs and plastic casts of everything. While that doesn't help us to name a man, once we've lined up on a suspect, there'll be a positive check on him. Especially the shoe prints. How's that? Well, the print of new shoes isn't of much use, but these were well-worn shoes. And from the print of a worn shoe, we can learn a great deal about the wearer's weight, height, length of stride, any peculiarity of gait he may have. Can you tell that from these? Yes. The man weighs in the neighborhood of 160 pounds, wears an eight shoe, and is probably of moderate circumstances. You're rather guessing at that last, aren't you? No. The shoes have been half sold. We have a number of bits of evidence like that, but the trouble with them, as you say, is they don't offer leads. They only offer checks, like the kind of suit he wore. You know that, too? Yes, and his blood. The keen-eyed inspector Jackson found some on a wire fence over which the body was dropped. He probably scratched his hand, lifting it over. Yes, but a uh, trace like that on a barbed wire fence, could that be enough uh, to be of any use? Did I say a barbed wire fence? Didn't you? No. <laughs> well, what other kind could a man more naturally scratch his hand on? It was a barbed wire fence, of course. <laughs> I was only trying to impress you fellows with my keenness. Can't a man get any credit around here at all? <laughs> well, in that case, I'll give you an opportunity to impress the whole city. Does this suggest anything to you? Yes. It suggests very strongly that you're eaten up with envy. You see my name on the front page of every paper. So you make a desperate effort to elbow your way into my case by insinuating that you're the guilty man. But it's no use, my boy. You scratch yourself for nothing. Did you ever see such selfishness? Did you, um... Put anything on it? Yes, some antiseptic. How did you do it? Last night, I uh, cut it on a tin can. Huh. Well, uh, watch it. Yes, I will. Would you like to hear exactly how the police figure it happened? Yes. <laughs> you bet we would. Oh, well, come in the lounge. Thanks, boys. Good night. Good night, sir. Coffee and cigars inside, Boris, please. Yes, sir. William, check in the lounge. Please. Very well, Mr. Laylaw. They got a line on a woman this afternoon. Frank! Yeah? Oh, hello, Martin. May I see you for a moment? Certainly. I'll join you in a minute. Great stuff, knowing a district attorney. Get all the inside dope. Yes. Frank's a very smart man. Yes. You're a bit off your feet, aren't you? Uh, just a bit, I suppose. <laughs> Haven't been sleeping very well. Hmm. Missing the family, eh? 
Yes, very much. Yes, well, I think you could do with a few pills. You're not the uh, absent-minded professor type, are you? <laughs> I've tried not to be. Two a day's all right. Should pep you up considerably. But I'd hate to think of you wandering foggily into the bathroom and popping them into your mouth like salted peanuts. Poison? Uh, not in the technical sense. It's a gland concentrate. And too much would hit the old heart like a sledgehammer. Instantly? Well, a matter of 20 or 30 minutes and bang. What's that? Prescription for Richard. It not only kills you if you take enough of it, leaves no trace. Just a case of heart disease, that's all they could say. I suppose there's no way of telling how many of your patients you've disposed of in that way. <laughs> None whatever, so forget it. <laughs> you said uh, that they've located the woman? Not quite. The police theory this afternoon was this. Mazard, a bachelor, had a sweetheart. His business associates are quite sure of that, but who she is or where she lives, they don't know. Pretty nervous man in romance, it seems. At any rate, when he reached Penn Station, he went to call on her. Either a man was already there, or he came during Mazard's visit. And this man, my lady preferred over Mazard. Why do they think that? Well, otherwise, if her true love had been killed, she would have most likely done something to bring the killer to justice. This is just a theory, of course. I said that. So they fought, and Mazard was killed, probably with a pair of scissors. That's the medical examiner's belief, anyway. Then, in a panic, they loaded the body into a car, his or hers, and took it to the place where it was found. Now, these two people, this man and this woman, sit, hating and fearing each other, each wondering how long it'll be before the other is caught and blabs out the whole story. <laughs> Always a woman, eh? Wait, I'm not through. That, I said, was the theory this afternoon. And what is it now? Well, now it's anybody's guess. Something came up just as I left the office that pulls the rug right out from under that theory. Really? It seems that Mazzard's associates, always afraid he'd get into trouble with his temper, had engaged a man, a bodyguard, to follow him secretly at all times. Was well, that night too? That we don't know. We don't know because he's disappeared as well. Then there's your murderer, isn't it? Hmm? Could be, but not necessarily. Then why hasn't he shown up? Uh, it's not that simple. He could have murdered Mazard, yes. He might have tried to blackmail him and killed him in a fight. Or he might have witnessed the killing and is getting ready to blackmail the killers. But even if he's 100% innocent, he still won't walk in and talk. Why not? Because he's hot. He's a known crook with a blackmailing record. That's why he was thrown off the force, for shaking people down. And he's wanted for at least two other raps. We'll get that gentleman when we run him down, and not before. <laughs> nice fellow to pick for a bodyguard. Oh, don't ask me why Wall Street geniuses do anything. He's <laughs> tough and strong, and I suppose that's all they thought of it. Anyway, I'm going up tomorrow morning to have a look over this place where they dumped the body. Either of you fellows like to go with me? I'm sorry, I wish I could, but I'm operating in the morning. Richard? Oh, I'm afraid that... Uh... Oh, you go with him. You've got no classes tomorrow, you told me, sir. Yes, I know, but... Uh... He'll go. I'm his physician. I order him to. <laughs> Give you something to think about. What time? I'll pick you up at your apartment at 9.30. Very well, I'll be ready. Good. We'll try to show you how the law operates to nail a man. Richard? This is quite an adventure for me. Anything new? Nothing very important. Fred? Yes, sir. We're picking up Jackson at the toll gate. Right, sir. District Attorney's Office. Any luck? Fellows is not on duty. We'll check at his home this afternoon. Inspector Jackson, President Wanley. How do you do, Inspector? Pleased to meet you, sir. Oh, uh, excuse my left hand. I have a little cut. Oh, yes. How's it coming? All right, it's nothing. How did you say you did it? Well, uh, I was opening a can in the kitchen the other night, and the can opener slipped. What was in the can? Poison ivy? <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid that was pure stupidity. Uh, the next day, I was looking for a lost golf ball, and evidently I got into some poison ivy. You must have scratched it. That's a pretty bad infection. Well, it's an awful nuisance, I know that. 
Is, is this your case, Inspector? For the moment. They're all his cases, all the tough ones. Inspector Jackson's head of the Homicide Bureau. Oh. Anything new since I left? Well, we picked up that woman this morning. Good. What's she got to say for herself? Well, we'll see her when we get there. They're bringing her up. Inspector? Good morning, Captain. You know Mr. Laylaw, don't you? You bet. Very glad to see you, Mr. Laylaw. Glad to see you, Captain. And this is Professor Wanley? That's right. Captain Kennedy. Pleased to meet you, Captain. Pleased to meet you, Professor. That woman here yet? Beck has her in the car. Well, let's go over this layout first, then we'll get to her. All right, Inspector. Over here. Now, here is where he parked his car. The tire tracks are gone, of course. But we have cast and photographs. They're good with 716s between 15 and 20,000 miles. Standard equipment on two or three popular make-up cars. The motorcycle officer on duty remembers seeing a Cadillac at the traffic signal. That may be worth keeping in mind. Did he see who was in it? Yes, the driver, a man, but he doubts very much if he could identify him. So I don't think that's going to lead us anywhere. Well, anyway, he got the body here. Where'd he take it? I'll show you. We got cast of his shoes going and coming. Richard! What? You're going to be the guide? Oh, am I going right? As straight as an arrow. Professor, eh? <laughs> Say, you think we'd better look into this, Mr. Laylaw? <laughs> well, uh, that's very funny. I wasn't even thinking where I was going. I, I was just thinking what the inspector said. That's all right, Richard. Don't get excited. We rarely arrest people just for knowing where the body was. <laughs> I don't imagine our killer was very familiar with this spot because the fence was too near the road for his purposes. At any rate, he couldn't go much further without a great deal of difficulty. So he just dumped it over down there. Now, there isn't anything in particular to see, except you want to keep the whole setting in mind. He tore his coat, probably his sleeve, as he lifted it over because we picked up a couple of shreds of woolen fiber. Couldn't have been from Mazza's clothes. No, different material. And we've got a sample of blood from this barb. He certainly didn't pick himself an easy job. Mads had weighed close to 200 pounds, you know. Yes, it must have been pretty tough going. Yes, especially at night. Well, yes, it may have been at night. I suppose so. But I was thinking of it as early morning, along about daylight. Well, I, I thought the papers said night. Anything else, sir? I can't think of anything else. You, Richard? <laughs> well, why ask me? I'm... I'm simply bowled over by the amount of information the police have got out of such apparently insignificant details. Well, it's hardly spectacular. Merely police routine so far. But there is one thing we have in our department that is really worthwhile, Professor. What's that? Patience. I imagine so. Want to see the woman? Might as well. What's that for? Oh, I had one of the men put that there this morning so you wouldn't brush against that bush. It's poison ivy. Very thoughtful, Captain. Well, too late to do me any good. That's right. Looks as if you'd have a little more explaining to do, Richard. <laughs> Closing in on me, huh? If you'll only confess, Professor, we can wrap up this whole case before noon. No, not me. I'm afraid you'll have to work for this one, Inspector. There you go. Never any consideration for us poor cops. Let's have the woman. Yes, sir. All right. All right. If you don't mind, I'll go sit in the car for a little while. I'm not feeling very well. What's the matter, Richard? It's not serious, is it? Oh, no, 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 not at all. You, you go on. I'll be all right. Well, if you need me... No, no, no. You, you go right ahead.
Well, that's all. We can go now. Well, goodbye, Professor. Hope you'll be feeling better soon. Thank you. Well, what do you think? The woman? You think she's the one? No. She's got something on her conscience. But what woman hasn't? <laughs> yes, uh, where do they find her? Second class hotel off Broadway. I don't know. She seems a bit dingy to me for Mazard. He'd do better than that, I'm sure. Cheap uh, looking? Bottom of the barrel. It's the bodyguard who's hot now, anyway. You find. Have you seen the early editions? No. Your pictures in the Times. Congratulations. Will you tell me what you mean? Listen. Dr. George Felix Reynolds, president of Gotham College, yesterday announced the promotion of Dr. Richard Wanley to head of the Department of Psychology. Oh, oh, of course, I, I wasn't expecting it to fall. Did I frighten you? A bit. Is, uh, everything all right? I suppose so. You've, uh, heard nothing from anybody? Have you? No, not so far. I'm not worrying now. I'm sure we're out of it. Aren't you? I, uh, I hope so. And I'm not going to bother you, believe me. Oh, it's quite all right. I'm rather glad that I've heard from you. Good night, and thank you. Good night. Yes? Miss Reed. Who is this? Open up. I want to have a little talk with about our friend, Mr. Mazur. I don't know you, and I don't know your friend, Mr. Mazur, so beat it. Listen, you don't want me to get tough, do you? I don't care how tough you get. You're not coming in here at this hour. I am not kidding, lady. Either you open this door, or I'm going to the police. Got to say and get out of here? Sure. If you didn't hear it, it was on the radio tonight. Another reward for $10,000 for any information leading to the arrest of the murderer of Claude Mazard. You didn't hear it? And if I had, it wouldn't have meant one thing to me. Now, if you're going to start claiming you never knew him, you can save your breath. Because I've been tailing him for months. And I've tailed him here many a time. He's been here, but not under that name. I never knew anything about who he was until I saw his picture in the paper. After he was killed. So you're the one that's wasting your breath. <laughs> well, let's see if I am. Don't mind my looking around a little, do you? You bet I do. I know nothing whatever about the death of Mr. Mazard, and you've got no right oh, to... Listen, 
Take it easy, will ya? It's been in the papers that they're looking for some woman in you. And I'm telling you, you're the only one. But have you been to them and explained to them how you had nothing to do with it? Of course not. It's not me they're looking for. Oh, come now, Miss Reed. Tell you till I find it. Settle for some blood, or a photograph, or a confession. Any little thing like that. Some brown, some black. Mr. Mazard's was brown. Good housekeeper, I guess. Yes, sir, clean as a whistle. Not a finger mark anywhere. Not even where you'd think they'd be naturally. Could be, you know. Those little stabs. That ain't Claude Mazard. And it ain't Alice Reed. And you had it hit, too. What's his first name? Robert? Richard? Oh, I'm getting warm, all right. No question about that in my mind. All right. What do you want? Now you're talking. I don't want to make trouble for anybody. I can, of course, but I don't want to. But the way I figure it, you just don't want the police nosing around in any of your business. Isn't that right? Who does? That's what I mean. So I'll tell you how we can fix it. There's a $10,000 reward out for just the kind of information I got. But I don't see it that way. The way I see it, if I got 5000 from you, That'd be the end of it, so far as I'm concerned. Are you nuts? From you and the guy, I mean. I haven't got $5,000, and there isn't any guy to get it from, so you may as well go right along to the police and tell them whatever you wish. Now, you don't want me to do a thing like that, Miss Reed. Mr. Mazard was a very rich man, and you can't tell me you didn't get something off him. And don't forget, 
You'll be a lot better off dealing with me than you would with the homicide squad. You don't want to go to the chair, do you? I want you out of here. That's all I want. I have a pin and bracelet he gave me worth more than a thousand dollars. Will you take them and get out of here? No, ma'am. Nothing like that. Nothing but cash. Five grand. Cash. Well, as a matter of fact, you're simply bluffing. If you can get 10,000 from the police, why would you be satisfied with 5,000 from me? What if I told you to just get out of here and go whistle for it? You want to take a chance on that? You see, honey, you did it. You and this guy. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be talking to me about it. If you'd been in the clear, you would have called the cops the minute I walked in. I know that. So you gotta look at it my way, don't you see? I have to think it over. I have to have some time. That's okay. I'm not pushing you. Take tonight and tomorrow. Think it over. See if I ain't right. See the guy? Explain it to him. And I'll be back here tomorrow night at 8.30 for the dough. Cash. But don't try to run away or pull any tricks like that. Because I'll be keeping an eye on things pretty close. Good night. And don't fret. You get the money, and that'll be the end of the whole thing. I kept it because, because I wasn't sure of you then. I, I wanted something. Oh, well, it's done now. Are you angry with me? About the man? No, I can't think of anything else you could have done. I don't expect you to pay all the money, though. I have a little, and I can raise a little more on that bracelet and some other things Mr. Mazin gave me. You're very fair, Alice. Quite generous. It's worth it to get rid of him. Well, paying him $5,000 isn't getting rid of him. That's just the first installment. If we pay him once, it'll go on as long as we live. But we've got to, haven't we? If we don't, he'll set the cops on us. I'm sure of it. So am I. That's what blackmail means. You pay or the blow falls. What can we do? There are only three ways to deal with a blackmailer. You can pay him and pay him and pay him until you're penniless. Or you can call the police yourself and let your secret be known to the world. Or you can kill him. Take long. I have it ready in powders. I'll be all right? Yes, I suppose so. Same doses. You need rabbits. Got any children, you better not leave that laying around loose. I won't. Ah. 
down. Do you know? I don't think so. Did you look? Yes, but there wasn't anybody, I'm sure. Is it the police? Oh, please, Alice. If you want to play, you must do your homework first. If you do your homework first, then you can go. Mom. Down. Up. I give you my word of honor that there isn't a faintest sign the police know we're alive. Believe me, please. I'm all right now. Go on. Well, there's uh, $5,000 in that package. But if you run into any kind of difficulty, don't let him have but part of it. Tell him that's all he could get today, that he'll have to come back sometime tomorrow evening for the rest. You understand? I understand. But what about the... Uh, that's in there, too. It's powder. But you needn't worry about his seeing it because it dissolves almost instantly. How much? You'll find a note about that in there. Uh, I don't know what else we can do, Alice. But if you don't think you can go through with it, we'll try and think out another plan. There's nothing else we can do. I know that. How soon does it work? Well, that uh, takes effect, I'm told, and... 20 or 25 minutes. So you better make sure he's out of your apartment. All right. You better go now. Wish me luck. Good luck. And if you lose your nerve, don't get frightened. We'll find another way. I won't lose my nerve. I didn't know over what you might have got some cute idea. No. Pretty dialed up, huh? Is that for me? I'm glad if you like it, of course. It's okay. That Mazard knew how to pick them, all right. Can you sit down for a minute? Sure. But make it short, will you? $5,000 is a lot of money. Uh-oh. It's a lot for me, anyhow, and I haven't been able to raise it on such short notice. And what am I supposed to do about that? I only want you to be reasonable, that's all. I want you to give me a little more time. How much have you got? 2900 <laughs> That's what I thought. What do you mean? That's the kind of a figure I'd say if I had some other idea in mind. Not too little, 
Not too big. Don't you believe me? Stop kidding. Let's have it. Come on. I can get the rest by tomorrow night if it's all right with you. Who told you to say all this? Nobody. Nobody, huh? Is it all right? You're pretty cute, you know that? Is it all right? Well, what else can I do if you haven't got it? I think I need a drink. Would you like one? I don't mind. What do you got? I'm going to have a scotch and soda. Make it two. Boyfriend all this time. There isn't any boyfriend. I told you that. Isn't he kicking in? You don't believe a thing I say, do you? I'm just naturally what they call a cynic, honey. What kind of a guy is he, anyway? Shoving a nice kid like you out in front. What's the use of my trying to tell you anything? So, all right. If everything's so kosher, what are you giving me this dough for? Just because you like me? I'm giving it to you because I don't want to be mixed up in this thing in any way. Not because I had anything to do with it. Oh, me. But because in my position, you can't tell what they'll try to hang on me. How would you like to get out of this whole thing? What do you mean? Exactly what I'm saying. Get out of it. Completely. How? Go away with me. Think about it for a minute. I don't have to think about it. I'm not such a bad guy, you know. I didn't say you were. But what's more important? Outside of this boyfriend that you haven't got, I'm the only person in the whole world who knows you even knew, Mazur. Think about it that way for a minute. Havana, it'll be a sense to make South America, and that's all there is to it. If I thought... If you thought what? If you thought what? Have you any more money than that? Keep it. But why? Take a look in the mirror, beautiful. And if you're thinking of somebody else, don't be a sucker. In a jam like this, you gotta look out for yourself first. I suppose so. Do you think he'd think of you if he had an out? When would we leave? The sooner the better. Tomorrow morning? Tonight it'd be better. Would it make a great deal of difference? Not if it's positive for tomorrow morning. Well, I'll have to do some phoning. I can't have some people I know running around to the police and getting excited about a disappearance. Yeah, you'll have to watch that. Think up some kind of explanation. Is it a deal then? I guess so. I guess it is. All right. Give me a kiss. You're not still worried, are you? Oh, I suppose not. 
You leave it to me. We'll do all right. Apparently, I'll have to. I don't seem to have any other choice. Oh. Don't you want your drink? I don't think so. I'll put some more ice in it. I suppose I could say I was going to the coast. Well, here we go. You really want me to drink this? Well, why not? It's all settled, isn't it? That's what I thought. What do you mean? You take it. I've got mine. You take this one, I'll take yours. Go ahead, what's the matter? Nothing. All right, then. Drink it. Drink it. What do you take me for, some kid? I don't know what you mean. And all this time I've been trying to give you a break, trying to get you out of this jam. I got a good mind to break your neck. You're crazy. I don't know what you're talking about. No, then why wouldn't you drink it? Now let's have the rest of it. There isn't any more. Will you stop acting like I'm a school kid? Get the rest of that dough and get it quick. Come on. Not under the mattress. You amateurs. What else you got here? How could you lie to Patty like that? How did you think you could get away with it? Will you go now? Will you go? Sure. But first, because you've been such a smart little double-crosser, I'm going to give you another little job to do. I'm going to let you dig up some more dough for Patty. Another five grand by tomorrow night. How do you like that? It's no use. I can't do it. I think you can. You try, anyway. And I'll be around again tomorrow night just to see what luck you have. So long. more collateral. I'm sorry. But I don't know what else I could have done. I was so scared. I'm sure you did all you could. We're just not very skillful at that sort of thing. What can we do now? I don't know. I haven't any idea. I'm afraid I'm too tired to think about it any more tonight. Too tired.
neighborhood last night, and I was prowling along in the car when I spotted him back there. So I called him to halt, and what does he do but start shooting? Let's take a look. He did. I didn't see him. He was just walking along when... He done all right for himself, huh? Mm -hmm. What I can't figure is what he started shooting for. He just didn't like the idea of burning, I guess. Matches. That's very funny. I was beginning to get an entirely different idea about this. All right, folks, break it up. Break it up. It's all over. Break it up. Come on, man. let's bring it up. Now. Morningside 5354 out of order. I've been ringing it. Will you try it, please? Will you? It's very important. Ten thirty, Professor Wanley. Yes. It's ten thirty, mm -hmm. sir. Good 
My hat, please. tell you how happy I am to see you alive and in such good health. Oh, thank you, Professor. <laughs> Taxi, Professor? No. It's time to say good night. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night.